So I'll tell you a little bit today, uh, mostly about our, our organ or chip work. And I chose this topic because of uh, the collaboration that we have with Ryerson and with Scott through the CFI grant where we are starting to establish this uh, Ontario Quebec Center for Organ or Chip Engineering. And so if you think about uh, the heart muscle, which is my, one of my uh, favorite topics, in this uh, kind of half illustration, half immunostaining that we show here, we can see that uh, heart muscle is, uh, contains elongated cells. These cells are aligned in parallel. And uh, if you look uh, cl more closely into structure of each of these cells, you can see that inside they actually have these cross striations which are uh, just very precisely aligned sarcomeric proteins. And it is actually the sliding of these sarcomeric proteins that enables contraction of the entire uh, strip of the heart muscle. So one of our goals is to establish a culture system that would reproduce this fidelity. But uh, if you want to uh, engineer the whole, whole heart, then you're dealing with a lot more complex problem. Uh, because if you look at this uh, slide, you can see that there is a really amazing complexity in structure going from the micrometer and even nanometer scale all the way to the centimeter scale. So adult heart cells in your uh, heart, they're rod shaped, they have these cross striations, and then at the millimeter scale, they're aligned in parallel. But it's almost like these sheets of cells they actually twist and contract at the same time. So it's like when you're trying to dry a towel, you will be twisting, not just squeezing the towel, so more water comes out. And so the same thing with, uh, with the heart ventricle and uh, the heart chambers themselves. There is a very complex alignment of cells as you move through the ventricular wall that enables both twisting and contraction. So uh, basically, we always try uh, to develop culture methods that would uh, enable us to reproduce this structural complexity. But uh, where are the cells gonna come from? So if you want to build a human heart or a human heart muscle, or even a, a, just a tiny strip of human heart muscle for drug testing, where are the cells gonna come from? So you're probably looking at this slide and you're thinking, well, it's a nuclear bomb in a Pacific. What does this have to do with the current talk on organ or chip engineering? Am I in the wrong seminar room? And you are not in the wrong seminar room. It's actually quite relevant. There, there is this paper published in, that was published in Science in 2009 that actually um, provided some proof about the ability or inability of adult human heart cells to uh, divide. So when I was in uh, grad school and in university, they would tell us that you're born with a certain number of cells heart cells and you die with that same number or less because heart muscle cells, cardiomyocytes, they are terminally differentiated and they cannot divide at all. That was something that we learned. And basically, <laughs> it's almost like, well, where, how can we get more cells? Uh, due to these nuclear tests in the 1940s and 50s uh, that occurred mostly in the Pacific, there was a very high amount of carbon-14 that was uh, released in the atmosphere. And if you basically look at some data presented in this paper and other papers as well, it was almost like a spike of carbon-14 all around the world. It doesn't matter that this was done in the Pacific. In about two years, this carbon-14 go goes around the world. And uh, essentially, you know, uh, the uh, level started declining after about 1958 when there was uh, an agreement signed amongst the nations that they will stop above ground nuclear testing. So this actually means that people who were born in the 40s and 50s, they were exposed to this spike of carbon-14 and it's almost like a labeling experiment that we do in a lab on like a smaller scale. And based on essentially carbon dating of heart cells from patients who were born around that period, these scientists in Sweden established that heart cells can actually divide and they do divide, but at a very, very slow rate. So if you're about uh, eight years of age, uh, half of your cells in your heart will come uh, from uh, essentially new cells, and the other half are those that you were born with. So this tells us that the paradigm that we learned is not entirely true, but still we are not able to expand the cells at, half, at fast enough rate 
to do anything meaningful with them, right? So even if people in this room are willing to volunteer some heart biopsy for, to make more cells, we would not be able to do it in a reasonable period of time. And so there is this paradigm now that overshadows all of the research in drug development and also biological research because you don't have enough human cardiomyocytes. People usually use cell lines like uh, hex cells or CHO cells and they would um, transfect human ion channels into these cells, for example, Herc channel, and then they would uh, add compounds and figure out how the currents change. So once, um, you know, this stage of testing in monolayers passes, then people move to animals. And usually, uh, all of this research is done in mice and rats, which are not human. And then, very rarely, you know, pharma companies would test something in monkeys and, or even dogs or animals that are larger animals such as that. And then from animals, a uh, drug would move into humans. So when I started first working on this, when I would ask uh, people, well, how sure are you that a drug is safe before you move into humans? They would say, well, we are about 75 to 90 percent sure, right? That was, to me, a very low number because I trained in engineering. And in an engineering school, they teach us that you have to be 200 to 500 percent sure, right? The safety factor that you build in all of your design, and I'm sure, you know, the students here had that same experience, you have to be like, uh, if, uh, you know, you're designing a column to hold certain weight, the column is actually designed to hold two times more weight than it actually does. Same with like pressurized vessels, right? So there is always this safety factor. But in the biological research, in this particular type of research, there is no safety factor that's greater than one. So that was uh, kind of different from what I knew before. And uh, so as a result of this, there actually, if you look at this slide, what, these are different drugs by different various manufacturers for various indications and they have one thing in common. They have all been withdrawn from the market due to cardiac side effects. So in fact, cardiac toxicity is one of the key reasons for withdrawal of approved drugs together with hepatotoxicity. Uh, one very pronounced case is, that many people know of, and I'm sure there are people here who might remember, was Vioxx in like early 2000s, late 90s. It was at some point withdrawn from the market because it caused about 27,000 uh, myocardial infarctions and sudden cardiac deaths in the United States. And it cost Merck about $5 billion in a, a criminal and a civil settlement. So it's one of the m more dangerous drugs if not prescribed uh, uh, properly. And uh, also if you, if you look at about the number of drugs being approved every year, in these uh, solid bars, there are less and less drugs approved every year, and the cost of bringing one drug to the market is greatly increasing. And so the FDA says, well, it's not us, because pharma companies are putting less and less drugs into the, basically, applications, INDs, every year. And uh, so basically, if you extrapolate this, there will be a point where, if it just continues like this, there will be no new drugs uh, that are being applied for or approved. And with iPS cells, there is definitely a uh, potential to change this paradigm completely. So in 2006, when uh, Shinya Yamanaka described how to derive iPS cells from adult cells uh, by transfection with uh, uh, specific transcription factors, now suddenly there is a possibility to create unlimited numbers of cardiomyocytes. So now we have human heart cells, really for the first time in history, uh, we have abundant numbers of human heart cells coming from uh, uh, essentially adult source through this reprogramming process without any ethical concerns because this is different than hum human embryonic stem cell research because it does not involve destruction of the embryo. And uh, we can also make other cells. We can make liver cells and so on. So there is really a potential now to change the drug discovery paradigm and to enable uh, modeling of disease. So what's the problem there? Why are engineers needed in this research? Why, why should we be involved? Why should we bother? If we can make iPS cells and there are people who develop directed differentiation protocols, for example, Gordon Keller, he has the uh, oh, best differentiation protocols in the, in the world, so why are engineers needed? The problem is if you, uh, for example, take a look at this picture here. These are embryoid bodies that are usually used for differentiation of cells. 
and uh, they result at some point of after about two weeks to three weeks of differentiation you can get beating cardiomyocytes. On this side, if you look at uh, these pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, you can see that they're kind of polygonal in shape, they're triangular, triangular in contrast to adult cells, which are rod-shaped cells, they're much, much larger, and they have these registers of cross And also these uh, uh, cells that are derived from stem cells by directed differentiation, they show signs of functional immaturity. For example, they don't fire uh, uh, calcium transients, if you apply caffeine, they just don't have appropriate responses to pharmacological agents. And so this means you cannot use them for drug testing because uh, the need there is really for adult population. And these cells are more like fetal cells, they're not really like the cells in adult hearts. And so we thought, well, as engineers, we can uh, really contribute there because, um, you know, one of our main hypotheses is that better function will follow better form. So if we can design systems that enhance cell structure, we'll be able to get better function. So a few years ago, we published in this uh, platform that we call BioWire, that essentially we went into the clean room at the University of Toronto. We created these um, very small PDMS-based microvels. They were about 600 microns across, five millimeters long. And um, we were inspired sort of by the native heart niche where we can see that the cells are elongated, they're aligned in parallel, and they follow one of these capillaries. So to uh, enable that following to occur, we would place one suture in a microfabricated well, and then we would take cardiomyocytes uh, derived from uh, iPS cells or human embryonic stem cells according to protocols that Gordon Keller published, and using hydrogels, we would seed them into one of these wells. And then the cells will essentially start pulling on the matrix, and as they pull on the matrix, they will remodel this gel matrix and then they hit the suture, kind of they have nowhere to go, so they have to start elongating. And so that was one step, controlling just the microenvironment structure and a little bit of mechanical properties by this tension that we control through uh, uh, cell-free modeling of the matrix. And the other thing is that we did is we applied the electrical stimulation of increasing frequency. And every day we would increase frequency by a little bit. And the reason we did that is because uh, um, the first beats in the developing embryo are very slow, they're irregular. They occur about three weeks of gestation, in many cases before the expecting mom even knows that she's expecting. And then they start increasing. And then uh, they peak at about three hertz or 180 beats per minute at about seven weeks of gestation and then they slow down. So that was one of our protocols. And the other protocol was really creating a boot camp for the cells because we don't have months to uh, mature these cells. We want to do it in a faster period of time. And so in this second protocol, we would apply a stimulation rate going up to six hertz. And uh, so at the end of this experiment, uh, I'm only showing one slide from this paper. Most of this is published, so you can uh, take a look at the paper. You can see that at the end of this, especially in the, this kind of boot camp, six hertz group, we get uh, rod-shaped cells compared to these embryoid bodies, time match controls, where the cells are still round. And we can see that these cells now fire calcium transients in response to caffeine. And uh, we can definitely see now that we have a more of her current, which is very important for drug testing, as I said before, because molecules that block this HERC channel can cause this very serious arrhythmia and, and death. And um, uh, so if you look at something that we started from, these EB uh, day 20 cells, they have very, very little HERC current, and this protocol definitely enhances HER current. But one thing we could not do in this paper is measure contractility. And so if you make a tissue that is anchored at two ends without any suture, this, this tissue can beat very nicely, it can move. And the suture is actually quite rigid, so you cannot measure contractile force. And um, contractile force is actually quite important because it is one of the hallmarks of the heart muscle is this ability to contract. And to get proper contractions, actually many, many things inside the cell, many different processes, as you can see in this image here, need to be properly uh, coordinated. And this is this excitation contraction coupling uh, cascade. 
So what my student Yimu did is then she re-engineered the BioWire platform. She made like the second generation of BioWire platform where we got rid of PDMS. This uh, uh, well is now made completely out of plastic. And the reason we did that is because PDMS is well known for its ability to absorb small molecules such as drugs and release them over a period of time. So we got rid of PDMS. Uh, PDMS. Now we have a plastic platform and instead of having one relatively rigid suture going across, we actually have two parallel polymer wires at each end. And then we have two carbon electrodes that we add at the end for electrical stimulation. And the same way as before, we would inoculate these microwells uh, using a hydrogel cell suspension. And we always spike in a little bit of fibroblasts, uh, up to 10%, not more, to enable matrix three modeling in the structure. And so at the end, you will get uh, a tissue that looks like this. It is contractile, it's beading. But these polymer wires, besides being flexible, they are also autofluorescent, which means that now uh, if you just image everything, it's kind of bright in this room, but if you look right here in the middle of the wires, you can see some deflection that is the result of tissue contraction. So now your image is not obstructed by the presence of the tissue itself. And by measuring deflection using image processing, you can actually figure out force of contraction using either calibration curves that you can create for the wire, or if the displacement is very small, you can use beam bending theory and it will accurately assess force within small displacements. And at the end of the cultivation process, we now have tissue that is uh, made of cardiomyocytes that are going from one end to another, spanning nicely around these wires. We want to make the tissue very, very strong, not just a regular tissue, but really mature it beyond what we achieved before. So again, we apply this electrical stimulation, but we now go up to four weeks and we ramp up to six hertz over a period of uh, three weeks. So one week for gel compaction and three weeks for Mm, uh, maturation with electrical stimulation. And then after that, we get some really functional hallmarks of a, a quite mature uh, cardiac muscle. And one of them is if you look at this uh, staircase, you can see we have force versus uh, time. And you can see that the force is going up. But also, we are driving contractions of this muscle by electrical stimulation and we're measuring force. And here we stimulate at one hertz two, three four, uh, hertz, four, and so on. And you can see that in each step, the force increases uh, slight, slightly. And this is a completely physiological uh, response that is called positive force frequency relationship. And uh, most mammals have it, and it's especially pronounced in larger animals, larger mammals, such as humans. And the reason for this is, let's say uh, you're running, uh, if you go in the morning and you're running, your heart rate will go up, but also the output, uh, the amount of blood that is ejected at every beat will go up because uh, that enables your body to more efficiently satisfy the uh, increased demand for oxygen for all of your muscles as the rest of the body and the rest of the body as you're working hard. So that's the reason why positive force frequency relationship exists. And so far in the literature, people had a really hard time reproducing this if they started uh, from cardiomyocytes that are derived from human pluripotent stem cells, such as iPS cells or uh, uh, human embryonic stem cells. And here, but this only happens in the stimulated group. With stimulation, we are able to get this uh, staircase. If we, and you can see that at very high frequencies, such as five and six hertz, which are definitely above the physiological range for this more mature muscle, we lose ability to capture these cells. But then when we turn off the stimulator, the tissue is completely quiescent, it doesn't beat. So do you think we are happy or sad? about the fact that the tissue doesn't beat. Happy, yes, we are happy. Because we are trying to uh, make a ventricular myocardium, and this uh, type of heart, of heart muscle uh, cells is not supposed to beat on its own. It's only supposed to follow, right? In, your, in, your, uh, in the adult heart, these cells actually follow uh, um, electrical signals that are coming from pacemaker cells. And if they decide to beat on their own, out of sync with these signals that are coming from pacemaker cells, it could actually become quite dangerous. And that's one of the reasons why um, 
if you just inject embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes into hearts of, let's say, pigs or monkeys, you can sometimes get very dangerous arrhythmia. It's because <clears throat> if the cells have autonom uh, autonomous activity. So we're actually quite pleased with this fact that they don't beat if they don't receive electrical signals. And then uh, uh, when we uh, turn on uh, another slow stimulus, you can see this very, very high uh, level of force, and that is called post-rest potentiation, and it occurs because of accumulation of calcium in the cytoplasm. So this just shows that this behavior is uh, reproducible over many different batches. Because we're dealing with imaging, imaging we can now load uh, different dyes into the tissue, and this is an example of calcium dye. So from the same movie, we can get both the calcium spike and the force spike. We can get calcium transient and force transient almost uh, simultaneously. And so this would be very important for pharma and for biology in general, because now you can figure out how a given drug affects, uh, let's say, EC50 on force and EC50 on calcium. These two should be related. But you don't want to have a drug that de increases background concentration of calcium in the cell. That would actually not be very safe. And uh, <clears throat> now what we are trying to do is actually to uh, bring everything in a multi-well plate format, either a 24-well plate or a 96-well plate, to increase the throughput. And so what people very often ask me, and it's a legitimate question, for the entire organ or chip field, and our work in particular, they tell us, well, how is this going to be useful for drug testing at all? It takes you four weeks to build a tissue. Who wants to wait four weeks? And you will never be high throughput. And uh, because for pharma, high throughput is something that happens you know, over a period, like you would uh, test 10,000 compounds in a day or so. And so we say, well, that's true. We are not high throughput, but we are high content. And there is a way, because you can get a lot of information from one tissue. And there is a way to marry high throughput and high content by, let's say, pre-screening uh, uh, drug arrays in a standard IPS monolayer format. And so just to show how we would do this, we collaborated with the GSK and we got a, a library of 367 small molecule kinase inhibitors from GSK. And so why are kinase inhibitors important? So many uh, cancer drugs are kinase inhibitors. Sometimes you have overactive uh, kinases in the body that cause, um, that cause different types of cancer. And so unfortunately right now the situation is such is that if you have uh, various types of cancer, you're treated with chemo, you actually have a very high chance of dying of uh, heart failure within like 10 to 15 years after surviving cancer. So it's almost like we healed cancer, but we gave you heart failure, you know? So you want to avoid that situation. A lot of chemo drugs actually affect your heart function. And so you want to uh, avoid that situation and you want to be able to find heart safe cancer drugs. So here in this paper that we published in uh, scientific reports uh, last year, we showed that you know, we can pre-screen these libraries of small molecule kinase inhibitors in uh, uh, just well plates, 384 well plates. And now if you, let's say, ha have 70 different molecules that you're looking at, you have three different doses and uh, this kind of initial dose and a washout, you're looking at different parameters such as calcium transient, cell viability, life cell number. Within calcium transient, there are many different things you can look at peak height, peak duration, how fast uh, it, uh, the, the transient occurs, how fast it also goes back to the uh, resting levels. Now you suddenly have uh, thousands of data points. What do you do with thousands of data points? So we uh, built a neural network and we asked the network to pick from this pre-screen one kinase inhibitor that will be most detrimental to heart function and one that is least detrimental to heart function. And then from there, we go into the biowire. And you can see these results from biowire, where we now look at contractility, that this inhibitor number 44, which was uh, deemed to be safe for the heart, indeed did not affect function in the heart, in the, this strip of heart, human heart muscle, biowire. Number 24, that was uh, predicted to be, by the artificial neural network, detrimental, you can see that after 24 hours, indeed, it decreases 
uh, contractile force quite profoundly. And sunitib is actually one of the approved cancer drugs. You can see that acutely with um, increasing doses, we do see quite profound decrease in uh, contractility and the ability for this to recover after a period of time. So uh, we believe that that's the point where heart tissues like this should be used after you've done certain pre-screen and now you have a smaller number of compounds where you want to validate certain targets and understand mechanistically the responses, that's where you would use these treated tissues. And so there is really a tremendous variability of uh, people around the world, you know, many genetic backgrounds. No two people are the same. We all experience different environments. And so with IPS technology, we can now build uh, a heart tissue, right? That's a heart tissue from somebody's cells. But you're probably wondering, how about me? You know, are you able to build my heart tissue and to uh, um, basically figure out uh, uh, what drugs I should take? And so there is actually uh, quite a profound potential to use this system in disease modeling. And um, there are many papers published before where people look at point mutations, basically mutations in single proteins. So there, somebody would have a mutation, let's say, in myosin-heavy chain and it affects them and people in their family, and it's usually either one mutation in one amino acid or several amino acids within you know, that one protein. They also people looked at uh, mitochondrial proteins within the same um, uh, settings. And so these are actually uh, heart disease as a result of these genetic mutations, although severe, is actually quite rare in the population when you think about it. And most of it is not a result of a single protein. It's actually this kind of genetic background that you have and the environment. And so that's why we were uh, <clears throat> interested in looking at something more complex that um, uh, is a polygenic disease that demand, depends on many, many, many different factors. So we collaborated with Uli Brockel at Medical College of Wisconsin. He is involved in this NIH hypergen study where um, there are people who have high blood pressure. So some people may have high blood pressure and they will be treated with drugs and they will be fine, right? So they won't have any other serious problems with, uh, to their hearts. Other people will get heart failure after 20 or 30 years of high blood pressure. So why do some people get heart failure and other people don't? So that's not really fully understand, understood, right? Because it's a very complex condition. And so uh, through Uli, and there are actually 6,000 people in this study who are being, being followed since, since 96. And so uh, through Uli, we were able to access cells, uh, iPS cells from these patients, and um, uh, actually their cardiomyocytes that were produced by uh, CDI. And so Uli just sent us pairs of cells. He said, I'm going to send you three pairs. I'm only showing you results here for one pair. And each of these pair, he kind of paired the patients. They were like siblings, and one of them was effect very highly affected, kind of had heart failure, and the other one didn't. And uh, so he said, figure out which one is from the patient who's highly affected, who has hypertrophy and going towards the loss of function. And so initially when we started doing this, when we grow cells for a short time, we don't see much of a difference between the two cell types. So we had to actually grow the cells for up to eight months. So remember, this is a condition that occurs after somebody has had hypertension for 20 or 30 years. So how do you mimic that in the lab, right? How do you build a disease model of something that happens in your body after 30 years without waiting 30 years? Because that would be quite useless. And so what we did here is uh, first we mature the cells using our regular protocol, bringing them to 6 hertz, and then we decrease the stimulation rate to about uh, 3 hertz, 180 beats per minute, and we continue to grow the cells from that point onwards for about six months. And at the end of this uh, uh, protocol, you can see that the control patient, their tissues were still able to beat, but in the affected patient, slowly we see decrease of contraction and uh, twitching, and at the end, there is basically no contraction in these uh, heart tissues, but we, we can uh, see through life that staining that the cells are indeed alive. So when Uli did RNA, RNA sequencing on these uh, affected patient cells and uh, control cells, he saw that the, in the affected patients, 
these <clears throat> gene groups that are uh, related to cardiac enlargement, cardiac dil dilatation, arrhythmia, and dysfunction were very, very highly upregulated. So we believe that now with BioWire we, and this prolonged stimulation, prolonged conditioning, we have tools to study these more complex diseases that occur as a result of many, many different factors. So essentially everybody in the world has focused so far on uh, uh, making ventricular myocardium because this would be important for replacement of heart function. And atrial cells and atrium is completely neglected. But uh, basically atrial fibrillation is the number one uh, uh, arrhythmia by frequency, like uh, occur, uh, by, by occurrence in, in North America. Many, many people have atrial fibrillation. So it would be important for us to build model of eight, models of atrial myocardium as well. So working with uh, Gordon Keller and Peter Bax, we actually developed these two uh, uh, tissues that are very, very distinct. So uh, we use Gordon's protocol and depending on the presence of retinoic acid, you can get either atrial or ventricular cardiomyocytes. And then we would take these predifferentiated, already mature myocytes, put them in our 3D tissue biowire, and then develop uh, different stimulation protocols. We are actually able to ramp much faster in atrial compared to ventricular myocardium. And at the end of this, you get tissues that express uh, very differently uh, ventricular markers. Ventricular tissue has a lot of myosin light chain 2V, atrial has very little. And even if you don't know anything about uh, electrophysiology, if you just look at these two different shapes of action potentials, you can see that they're very different. This is quite atrial and this is quite ventricular. So now we are able to distinguish very nicely atrial ventricular myocardium and also uh, show chamber-specific drug responses as well. And so all of this work is done in very thin muscle strips, sort of like that illustration that I showed you at the beginning, where we wanted to have a strip of uh, hard muscle that would be used for either disease modeling or drug testing. And uh, nothing is big, and nothing that I showed you so far uh, included any vasculature at all. But if you strip off all of the cardiomyocytes and you're only left with blood vessels in the heart, you can see that all you almost have the shape of the heart. So again, there is this kind of structure function relationship. To have this uh, heart muscle function at the larger scale, centimeter scale, you really need to bring in enough blood vessels to enable to high cell density that will enable this tissue to beat as it, as it should. So, you can see that each blood vessel is surrounded by very, very high density of cardiomyocytes in this SEM image because myocardium has by volume over 90% cells and very, very little matrix and other material. And so we always thought it would be so great if we are able to build a platform that uh, you can use for basic studies, for drug testing as an organ or chip model, but then that you can also implant in vivo. And uh, so um, what Boyang did, Boyang Zhang from my lab, uh, and he will be on the faculty at McMaster University, very, he's starting very shortly in July. So uh, he said, well, again, if we go to a clean room and if we just look at techniques for, uh, from semiconductor industry, they already know how to make this chip. And uh, so basically, this is just a very complex network at a micrometer scale. Why don't we go into the clean room and build a very complex network in the micrometer scale for uh, building of uh, heart muscle and other, other tissues as well. And so that's what Boyan did using elastomeric polymers. He built this uh, network that is branching in X, Y, and Z direction and uh, that can be endothelialized and perfused with blood or other material. This is actually a real micro CT image of an angio chip internal lumens. It is not a drawing. And so now when you have these lumens, if you endothelialize the lumens, you have to uh, provide flow, flow of culture media or flow of blood. So I'm a chemical engineer by training and we love pumps. We actually have entire courses on pumps and part of course is on fluid mechanics devoted to pumps. And Scott is uh, smiling there because he knows how this is, right? To love uh, pumps and flow. But if you go to a biological lab or if you go to a pharma lab, they don't have any pumps. I haven't seen any pumps there. And uh, so no pumps. So all they have is these pipetting robots. They have a lot of pipettes, 
a lot of pipetting robots, a lot of people pipetting. And uh, they have these uh, high content imaging machines. And if they want to pipette, if they want to um, transfer liquid from many thousands of wells at the same time, they don't even use pipettes anymore. They actually use these acoustic uh, droplet ejection systems. And at the heart of all of this is the footprint of a 96 well plate or this uh, well plate footprint. So we thought if people are really going to adopt our perfusible systems, they have to work without pumps because, you know, people have to fiddle with the pumps. This is not going to work. So we wanted to make sure we can uh, perfuse the endothelium and the vasculature of this angiochip without using pumps. So this image here just shows an endothelialized inner lumens that are branching uh, in two directions of angiochip. And here is a plate that we actually use to grow angiochip. And you can see that in the top well, these three rows, these are actually reservoirs, and we, we can put more culture media there than what we put in the outlet. And then the actual angiochip scaffold goes in the middle. So if you have the difference in the um, liquid levels between uh, inlet and outlet, this will cause a pressure head that will drive flow. And so if you just change media like you normally do in a biological lab every day or every other day, you can maintain this uh, pressure head that will drive the flow. And uh, so this is very easy. You don't have to deal with bubbles and uh, connecting stuff. The drawback is that you cannot create pulsatile flow. But we thought this is not so important or relevant for us because these blood vessels are pretty small. They're about uh, on the order of 100 microns or less. So these are like venules and pulsatility in venules is not so important. And uh, uh, so Boyan makes this and my other students also in the clean room using this 3D stamping technique where basically he will polymerize uh, this polymer, which we call POMAC, layer by layer by uh, UV light. So basically he'll stamp into PDMS mold a uh, little bit of POMAC, transfer it to a glass slide like this, polymerize, peel off the mold, and make the next, next step, and so on. So it is a little bit labor intensive. Uh, but the good thing, it is scalable in the sense that you can do many of them in parallel, such as shown here. And so then you, you get this 3D structure where now you can see a lumen where the blood vessel will be. And then there is the space, there is a mesh at the outside where you can grow the cells. And uh, so you're probably wondering, well, what's so special people have were able to make blood vessels before from polymers. So how were you able to get this paper into a high impact journal? And the reason for this is that um, if you think about polymers, and a good example is a Ziploc bag, what I usually say when I give a lecture like this. So when you put your food in a Ziploc bag, what are you doing? You're separating this food from the environment, right? Nothing can go through. Liquid doesn't go through liquid from the outside doesn't go into the bag and your food doesn't kind of leak or, or it doesn't pass through the bag. The only thing that can really pass is gases. So that's actually true, that kind of permeability is true for almost any polymer. It's actually very poorly permeable to anything except gases. So what people have done before with the polymers, yeah, they made the structure, but they had no permeability, nothing could go through. Proteins couldn't go through, cells couldn't go through. And vasculature is definitely well connected with the surrounding space. So what Boyan was able to do here is introduce two levels of permeability. There are these nanopores that enable uh, proteins to go through, and there are micro holes that enable cells to go through. And so the first step is actually just endothelialization of this inner lumen. And then we see that whatever cells we like in the parenchyma, and after gel compaction, you get a tissue that you like. So we can get nice vasculature on a chip that uh, this is staining for CD31, and we can perfuse these blood vessels that are here shown in orange with uh, uh, even human blood. And if um, these uh, blood vessels are endothelialized, you get lost, a lot less platelet adhesion as expected. If you start from something that is confluent and then you apply an angiogenic stimulus, such as in this, molecule, in this case, small molecule, thymosin beta-4, if we just put it in the parenchymal space, this angi angiogenic signal will drive migration of endothelial cells through these inner lumens. So they're now migrating through the microholes and into the parenchyma and they're sprouting. And as, 
And as they do that, permeability of this vasculature goes up by a lot. We can also um, stimulate the endothelium with molecules such as TNF-alpha and perfuse human monocytes, and this will cause monocyte rolling on the endothelium and transendothelial migration into the parenchymal space. And because this is now all happening on a plate system, I basically renamed this heart on a plate or liver on a plate. It's not really on a chip. And um, so using different types of cardiomyocytes, either from rats or human embryonic stem cells, we can make uh, this heart tissue that twitches. It propagates electrical impulses. And now we can add drugs through the endothelium and watch them perfuse into the parenchyma where they actually stimulate the contraction of the cells. We can also do uh, the same experiment with liver cells, and this image here shows cells that are derived from uh, human embryonic stem cells that we got from Gordon Keller, and these are uh, uh, from uh, hepatocytes derived from rats. We can see that these cells express albumin, and they can process urea, and also if we add drugs such as terfenadine and we let them perfuse, through the blood vessels in the middle, they will uh, actually uh, affect, they will be processed, and you can pick up the uh, product of the metabolism, which is called fexofenadine, in the outlet. We, uh, one of the criticisms when we submitted originally this paper is that the tissue is not thick enough. And this is a sort of, when a reviewer asks that question, you're always wondering, well, what is thick enough, right? So how big should it be? And because there is always, whatever you go back with, they can always say, well, it's not thick enough, make it thicker. And uh, there is never an end to that. So, but here, what we, uh, it's really a, so one way to do this is basically you can take many small tissues uh, that each have their own inlet and outlet and kind of sandwich them into a larger structure. And this is kind of modular approach that we showed that is unlimited. You can just go many, many times, but you don't have a single inlet and single outlet into this tissue. But what Boyan did is he went into the clean room. He just spent a lot of time there, built this very thick scaffold, about two millimeters thick. He had to extend the pressure head uh, um, basically make a larger reservoir. He had to uh, um, centrifuge the cells into the scaffold, and then he was able to get a tissue that's about two millimeters thick, which is as thick as the ventricular wall of the rat here. And uh, if you look at the cross-section, so this is about as thick as the wall of the uh, uh, heart wall of a rat. And um, you can see that the cells are present all throughout. What he also did is he ended, added some endothelial cells in the parenchymal space, so you got sprouting and cell interaction uh, from these uh, prefabricated uh, lumens and those that were actually self-assembling in the parenchyma. But what I think is really nice with this approach where you're working with polymers, and that's why I titled this talk Microfabrication of Elastomeric Polymers, is now you don't have the case where the cells are squeezed between PDMS and glass slide. And uh, you can just take this tissue out of, the, of this uh, um, fabrication plate that we use for cultivation. And the tissue is actually quite small. You can see it uh, here. It's quite small, but it still uses two million cells, which is a lot of cells. And uh, using this single inlet and single outlet, we were able to achieve direct surgical anastomosis to pre-existing vasculature. And this is one of the problems in tissue engineering. No matter what you make, when you put it in the, in the body, if there is no blood supply, the cells are just going to die. And so you can see that we established really nice blood flow right away in the R3 bypass configuration or R3 to vein, config, uh, vein configuration, and this is all happening in a rat. And because we still use two million cells, we wanted to make a, a smaller system that would be more uh, useful for drug testing. So we re-engineered everything in a 96 well play format. And we can make now these different models like liver, heart, or tumor in a 96 well plate. Uh, using this approach, it's very easy to link two compartments. So if you just take one big blood vessel and you let it run through the columns of this 96 well plate, you can easily connect, let's say, heart and a liver chamber. To make the tissue, we actually microfabricate a little well within a larger well. And then there are still these uh, micro holes that enables the cells to go back and forth. Uh, one cool thing about this platform is that we can uh, also microfabricate these cantilevers. And then uh, now you can perfuse drugs through the endothelialized tissue, and the cantilevers are moving so that you can tell the force of contraction 
through the perfused tissue, which is very cool, I think. And then also uh, now, uh, as we have permeable blood vessel to, due to the presence of these micro holes, with endothelial sprouting, endothelial cells leave the blood vessel and they go into the parenchyma. But when a cancer is metastasizing, the opposite process happens, right? The metastatic cells now invade the blood vessel and they go in. And with this platform, we can study this process of metastasis. We can figure out if this is, this is just a GFP labeled uh, breast cancer model, but we can figure out how the cells are leaving uh, the, the breast cancer and, and how they're accumulating into downstream well. But more recently now, if we uh, connect two tissues in parallel, and now we can follow, using microscopy, uh, this entire cascade. So uh, cancer cells are labeled with GFP. We can now see them. This is inlet actually to the cancer compartment, but they go everywhere, right? They even go upstream, they go downstream. They don't just follow the flow. So you can see this cancer tissue and you can see the cells that are present in the lumen and how they're moving to now a downstream compartment, which in this case we put cardiac tissue to be a downstream compartment, but you can put any tissue, you can be liver, we can make the liver with the same model. And you can see cancer cells in this actual lumen that is endothelialized, you don't see endothelial cells. And, uh, you can see, this is actually a little bit creepy image, you, you, uh, Heart cells are beating, but you cannot see heart cells because they're not labeled. These uh, bright green dots are actually cancer cells that left the metastatic breast cancer and they entered into this tissue. So this is just a movie to show this process, but now you can add different molecules and figure out uh, uh, at what point you can stop migration of these cells or their proliferation. So working with, let's say, GSK on the heart uh, uh, models, we showed them our angio tube and angio chip platform, and they said, oh, this is so great. Maybe you can make a kidney out of this. And so that's what we tried to do, and uh, they gave us podocytes, which are uh, found in the kidney glomerulus. And they said, well, why don't you just put it in your angio chip or invade platform? And we did that, but we didn't get much. We only got the images that look like this. And so you can see they're like flat pancakes of uh, podocytes on, on, on these uh, uh, kind of blood vessels that we make in the lab. So, but if you look at the native glomerulus, it's actually, the, its structure is actually quite different. It is uh, almost like a, a loop of capillaries that uh, makes like a spherical structure. And then the podocytes are actually sitting at the outside. And so one of the students, Andrea Lam, uh, who is actually working with us, but not directly, made, made this really nice uh, animation. And then on the outside, there are these uh, podocyte cells that are very, very highly branching, and they create these uh, interdigitations that are called slit diaphragms, and that's actually responsible for barrier function. And so going back again to our main paradigm, which is uh, structure-function relationship, we thought, well, you know, we don't have enough curvature, obviously, in our blood vessels. That's why these podocytes look like pancakes. They don't look like interdigitated, uh, interdigitating cells. And so what we did there is then we created this bubble surface. And on purpose, we have a little bit of non-uniformity there in bubble surface, uh, as, as you can see here. And so then if we grow, um, podocytes on, on these uh, flat versus bubble platform, either if we just have very simple culture media or if we supplement with different hormones, as shown here, we get very, very profound upregulation of nephrine expression. And nephrine is one of the key proteins that, that, that is found uh, there in, in these slit diaphragms. And so we have uh, uh, these very nice interdigitations forming on bubble surface. We are not saying these are slit diaphragms. We probably don't have very mature podocyte here as well, but we have a lot more branching than what we see on the flat surface. And if you just measure these digitation ratios and so on uh, uh, that we get on the bubble surface, we, uh, we are actually getting into the range of this physical appearance that you would get in vivo. And so we were also able to make this uh, bubble membrane, which we call top membrane, that is now able to uh, grow, we are able to grow podocytes on one side and actually to measure barrier function. And if you compare flat and bubble there, you can see that on the bubble surface, the cells are actually able to maintain much higher barrier fu function 
than on the, on the flat surface. So there is a hope there that now we can, this very, very simple culture system that doesn't have pumps, but it's all about you know, structure and function that maybe you can, we can extend to other uh, um, tissue types where curvature is important. And so just in the last three minutes, uh, I will tell you, I will switch gears, I will just tell you a little bit about in vivo, in vivo application. What are we doing for in vivo? And so as uh, many different students in my lab went to the clean room and they worked with this biodegradable polymer, POMAC, they were able to make many sophisticated structures where the basically microstructure is really controlled at a micrometer scale. They became really good in polymer processing. And then we thought, perhaps we can solve a bigger problem here. If you think about tissue engineering, the entire field of tissue engineering, if you make a tissue in the lab, how do you put it into the body? You have to cut the patient open, right? So depending on the size of, unless you're putting on the surface of the skin, there, there will be a surgery involved, right? So you're cutting some, somebody somewhere. And if uh, you're making heart tissue, then, you know, this is so invasive. It's like probably the most invasive procedure you can uh, think of when the chest is open. If you want to put something on top of the heart, very, very invasive procedure. And uh, this means that uh, engineering tissues, especially in the context of the heart tissue, will never be available for a large number of patients. And because uh, actually a very small number of patients undergo this open heart surgery and it's not going to be done just for the sake of testing a new procedure. So we thought would it be so nice to develop these shape memory scaffolds that we can inject through a keyhole with a, and basically have uh, maybe three small incisions into the chest rather than fully opening the chest. And so we were able to do this by um, microfabricating these elastomeric polymers in a specific way. So I'll just show you how this works. Uh, this uh, scaffold can be folded and injected through a very small orifice. And, uh, you know, you can see that it's opening up after injection. We can cultivate the tissue and it's gonna beat. And then we can also deliver a uh, actual tissue that's in the last slide uh, shown right here. Uh, these shape memory scaffolds are, uh, this is not chemical shape memory, this is actually physical shape memory. Shape memory is in the actual shape of the lattice and the elastic property of the matrix. And basically, uh, if you think about a rubber band, if you pull on the rubber band, uh, you will extend it. And then if you remove that weight or you just let go, the rubber band goes back to the original position because it's elastic. So this is kind of the similar concept of shape memory. And so you can see <clears throat> we tested many, <clears throat> many different designs empirically. And you can see some examples of successful and unsuccessful injection. On the right is uh, unsuccessful injection. You can see that uh, uh, the scaffold does remain folded. And so Miles actually quantified uh, these uh, occurrences. And then he saw that basically you have this very nice mesh in this uh, uh, number six that we contains straight lines, which we thought would be important for cell elongation, but also satisfies all of these criteria on successful injection and successful opening. And so one important thing to check is if the cells remain alive after injection. And so we look here and we can see that the, by life that staining, the cells will stain green and the t uh, polymer matrix actually stains red. We can see that uh, before and after injection, the cells are alive and the parameters of excitability are not affected. So ability is also not affected. Uh, we were able to do the same uh, experiment in uh, a mouse and a rat uh, subcutaneously when we inject the scaffold and we compare it to surgical placement. <clears throat> we can see with imaging that this scaffold actually opens up very nicely. Surgical placement is where we just cut the skin open and we kind of pull this flat place the, the tissue nicely, open it up, and then suture it. And in, uh, injection on the right is actually the case where you just pinch the skin, you inject some PBS first, and then you inject uh, the tissue and it will open up fully. You can see that the presence of cells by this bioluminescent imaging is not affected. Uh, and it's very similar be between surgery and, and injection. 
which tells us that the cells are not being uh, uh, damaged in any profound way. And then working with Chris Calderon over at SickKids, we were able to uh, operate on pigs and to inject these scaffolds through a uh, keyhole. You can see three keyholes here. One is for the camera. This one here is um, for uh, in injection of the patch. And this is actually a gripping tool that will place the patch at the proper place on top of the myocardium on the epicardial side. And so what you can see here is that we had to add some flaps on the side to actually make it a little bit easier for the surgeon to manipulate. Uh, we are working in a dry environment here because we cut the pericardium open and then this epicardial fluid gushes out. And so you're kind of working in a dry environment there. You don't have the luxury of injecting more fluid and then they can pull the tissue and put it at the right spot. And what we can see here is that at the end, when we take the heart out, the tissue is still present at that epicardial surface. And again, as the reviewer said, it shows that this is actually applicable to other sites. We were able to uh, develop a procedure to inject on top of the liver and as well to inject uh, a, around the aorta. Because there is very little space for injection of the liver, they actually had to inflate the belly a little bit by uh, application of CO2. That's why the belly looks quite inflated here at, a, at, at this picture, and then that, that provided enough space for the tools to come in. And so just in summary and future studies, I, I showed you basically uh, three main technologies from our lab. One of them was BioWire, which is used for heart cell maturation. It's PDMS-free. We saw several perfusible technologies that can be used to make uh, vascularized heart, uh, liver, and uh, cancer tissue. And we also looked at these injectable tissues, and we really have to do more long-term studies there. And so I'd just like to thank everybody who contributed to this work, our collaborators and my lab and funding sources, and I'll be happy to take your questions now. Thank you. Uh, I just want to present you with this uh, yeah. gift. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you very much. Thank you for coming here to, to today's keynote. Okay, great. Thank um, you. We have some time for questions. Now. Yeah. Uh, and there are microphones on the side, so it'd be great if you can walk to the microphone. Yeah, you're, um, you, you are constructing a cardiac uh, muscle cells. Uh, how, they are, how, how they are different than any other contractile cells, like uh, smooth muscle cells, for example? Well, so the, the, they're different in uh, the types of ion channels and the types of sarcomeric proteins that they have. So cardiac muscle cells exhibit quite uh, uh, regular beating when they're paced. And I think in, compared to smooth muscle cells, I think they have shorter transients. Uh, and um, I think they develop more force as well. So I know the difference in, in the normal tissue, but in your system, have you tested the difference? Yeah. So uh, we haven't uh, worked uh, a lot with smooth muscle cells. We only did actually very, very small experiment in this particular case with aorta, but uh, where we actually just built uh, the smooth muscle patch. We only have some immunostaining, but we haven't done uh, we haven't done uh, uh, extensive drug testing on smooth muscle cells. I actually have collaboration with Sima Mittal where uh, we are deriving uh, smooth muscle cells from some iPS cells and trying to see in more like this uh, a bio wire model if we can pick up some differences. But they actually, their contraction transients are very, very slow. And you add like a drug and then it takes like a long time for them to, to contract. It's uh, um, also a little bit of a challenge on image analysis as well to know when that transient started and stopped. Yeah, we were not electrically stimulating the perfusible systems, uh, especially the angiochip, um, uh, because it was too complex, too many moving targets happening at the same time. So those are not routinely stimulated. But uh, the invade platform, we now have uh, capability to stimulate because the electrodes are there. 
do they start bidding right away when we implant them? I cannot tell you if they start bidding right away, but uh, I can tell you that uh, in the uh, nature paper, we, uh, in the nature materials paper that we, um, we did with Chris and with Drenke Lee, the, the patches did improve function in a rat. I, I didn't show you the slides because the talk would be too long, but they did improve function. There might be a big mechanical component also, of, like if you just place this patch uh, at the outside of the heart and you have something there that prevents dilatation and keeps kind of the ventricular wall uh, very thick. Uh, I think that, that is probably the main way in, the, in, in which the patch uh, contributes right now. Because we still don't know how to overcome the epicardial barrier fully. Very, very good talk, uh, excellent talk. So two questions maybe. One question was, uh, uh, so you stimulate the immature cells to mature cells. So did you look at the phenotype change because from immature to mature maybe some phenotype change still happen? Yeah, we looked at especially, so we have a, a, a lot of electrophysiology and drug testing data and in particular, in this uh, last work, which is Yimu's work that is currently under revision, it's actually in like being reviewed by the journal after we responded. We did RNA sequencing with Brian Cox and uh, with the stimulation, you know, we looked at like over 60,000 genes and uh, there is about 12,000 genes that were significantly different with electrical stimulation. And then, especially with uh, the ventricular tissue, there is a big kind of divergence between unstimulated and stimulated. And then he was able to look at gene ontologies that are published for atrial ventricle. And he found some significant significance that this gene expression actually looks like gene expression in the adult heart. If I could, uh, the second question was, uh, uh, the immature cells may be some advantage because when you get into the tissue or into the organ, they can proliferate pretty fast. And then that's why the adult cells turn up well, oh, around time is very slow. So when you inject these kind of mature cells, are they proliferate well and then to migrate, you know, into the proliferate uh, much, I can tell you that for sure. And in fact, in the Nature Methods paper that Sarah published in 2013, at the end of even like two weeks of uh, maturation, electrical stimulation, the um, uh, number of proliferating cells drops down profoundly. Like we start, it's still very small percent of them, like about 7% proliferate. After two weeks in this biowire, only 2% proliferate. I think uh, after like four weeks in biowire, uh, probably there's barely any proliferating cells. Now the question is uh, this entire remuscularization paradigm. So Michael Laflamme, he came to Toronto and he published several, like I think in 2015, this paper in Nature, where they just took human embryonic stem cells and differentiated them into cardiomyocytes using embryo body, essentially, you know, something like Gordon's protocol. And he saw very serious ventricular tachycardia in monkeys, you know, very, very serious. And he repeated those same experiments here in Toronto with pigs. And again, you get ventricular tachycardia. So that's one of the big uh, safety concerns about the use of immature cells, right? So that's why there is this push, okay, can we mature them? And what is going to be the best way? I'm not saying our way is the only way to mature them. You might be able to do it by, you know, transfecting certain genes, you know, putting them some ion channel genes or even connecting 43 genes. But you you do get very profound ventricular tachycardia. And I, I attended one of his talks, and two out of seven pigs died out of ventricular tachycardia. And I think FDA Health Canada, when they look at this data, they're going to say these cells are not ready for translation. So I think there is still a big question for the field. How do you get quiescent cells that can integrate? Uh, because that's what you, that's what you want for re, uh, muscularization. Thank you. Thank you.